everybody, thank you so much for joining us today as we continue our series uh, made for this. And let me start with a shout out to those of you who are watching from San Jose. Make some noise in San Jose. And if you're visiting there at our San Jose campus for the very first time, welcome. And for the rest of you who are joining from uh, various online platforms across the country and across the world, and especially to those of you who are joining for the very first time, welcome. Uh, let's get busy as we continue with this series. Uh, can you just turn to, if there's somebody sitting next to you, just turn to them and just simply say, made to belong. Yeah, made to belong. Let's, let's frame this as we read Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. It's kind of our, uh, the, the center of our teaching text uh, today. The Apostle Paul is writing. Here's what he says. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. There ends the reading. Now, if by some chance you were following us uh, uh, from the beginning of this year, uh, I've been working through some very fundamental questions that is at the very heart of all uh, human beings that we find ourselves asking from time to time. And by the way, if you miss those uh, messages, we want to include, encourage you to go to our website. Uh, the information is on the screen. So the very first week, the basic fundamental question I raised was, who am I and why am I here? It's a question of purpose. And then we kicked off this series called Made for This. That first week kind of framed uh, the context for the series. Uh, and the first week of this series, we asked another fundamental question. Is this all there is? Which was about meaning. And last week, we asked another fundamental question as we were wrestling with how faith engages life in the midst of suffering and evil. The question is, what am I supposed to do with my life? How am I supposed to respond? This is a question of direction. Today, I want to raise yet another fundamental question as we think about what does it mean when I say made for this, made for what? It's all about a sense of purpose and meaning and direction in life. Well, here's another fundamental question. Where do I belong? That is a question of security. Both social scientists and theologians alike all agree that all of us were made with a need to belong. As a matter of fact, social scientists remind us that this need to belong is very evident very early in the first weeks of a child's life, a baby's life. As a matter of fact, uh, they talk about it in terms of attachment or attachment disorder. Attachment is from the sixth week to the seventh month, between six weeks and seven months, uh, every baby, if they're in a loving environment, smiles, Google eyes, laughter, warmth, all of that, they, they tend to attach to people indiscriminately. And then, uh, so scientists tell us from seven to nine months, uh, they, they have a preference in their attachment. And then after that, they are able to form multiple attachments. But if something goes wrong, if the environment is not warm or loving or whatever the case might be, uh, oftentimes baby uh, experience what is called an attachment disorder, or they may refer to it as a detachment uh, disorder, which means it's hard to connect. It's hard to feel like you belong. But this is not just true just for babies. It, this is true for all of us as we move through various stages of our lives. Teenagers, for example, as they move through their teenage years, they go through various hormonal changes and they go through their own experience of detachment as they pull away oftentimes from parents and from the philosophical, theological uh, teachings and paradigms that they grew up with. Uh, and they find themselves asking the question, where do I belong? As we move through various stages of adult life, whether it be menopause or midlife, we find ourselves again struggling with sometimes detachment, isolation. Where do I belong comes the question. Perhaps we move from one city to another, from one job to another. The question of where do I belong? Moving away from family, moving away from friends, detachment. And then, of course, there's aging. One day we wake 
up and we look around and all of the people that we used to connect with, relate to, and talk to, grew up with, many of them have passed on. We feel uniquely detached. The question, where do I belong? These are but a few examples of how this question pops up in our lives. You see, we all have a need to belong. We all want something that we can call my family, my people, my group, my team, my posse, my gang. We want to belong. Can you say belong? Chip Ingram, uh, in one of the books that I recommended a few weeks ago called True Spirituality, uh, Developing a Roman 12 uh, Life and Faith, he tells a story about a dear friend of his who is um, a major uh, mover and shaker in Atlanta. He says that when people talk about his friend, uh, all they say is that this guy is just smart and creative and innovative. And if you really want to get something done, here's the guy to go to. And he has a tremendous track rec record of success. But Chip says that he was sitting down talking to him uh, some time ago, and the friend said to him, I feel adrift right now. I don't know where I belong. A reminder that it's possible for you to be in the very height of your success, to be surrounded by power and wealth and all of the trappings of what we call uh, prosperity and still feel detached from a sense of community, detached from a sense of purpose, detached, detached, not quite Sure where you fit in. Here's the deal. You were made to belong. If somebody's sitting next to you, just simply tell them, you were made to belong. Here's what the psalmist says in Psalm 68, verse 6, uh, uh, 6a. He simply says this. God places the lonely in families. Can you say families? I like this notion, families. I'm not sure whether or not this is what the psalmist has in mind, but, but it strikes me that God creates Two families to help address this need for us to belong. The first family he creates is our biological family. And in some cases, you may be like me. I was born in one family, but I was ultimately adopted by my grand aunt and grand uncle and was raised in that adopted family, in that family. But God gives us family with the intent to create a space for us to belong. And yet we know that in so many different ways, families are broken and challenging. And then God created spiritual family, a spiritual family, because you see, we, were, we are mind, body, and soul. And at the end of, at the, end of the day, uh, we need a spiritual community, a spiritual family to connect with us on that spiritual level. As a matter of fact, most of the basic questions that I just kind of rolled out for you, they come out of this spiritual place. What is my meaning? What is my purpose? What is my direction in life? They are fundamentally spiritual questions that requires a connection with God and a connection with people who, who share the kind of common community with that God. You know, in the Old Testament, that community was found in the Jewish people in Israel. It was both a political community and a spiritual community. Spirit, political in that it had a king. Spiritual in that it, it had uh, the Ten Commandments, which was shaped around how to, how to relate to God and how to relate to each other, and then a whole host of other laws, 600 plus laws, and that was, very, that was at the very center of their existence. It was a spiritual community. The courthouse, if you will, was uh, subordinate to the temple. Uh, the king was held accountable by the prophet. And then Matthew tells us that 42 generations later, Jesus walks onto the stage. And what does he do? There was 12 tribes in the, that, that shaped the nation of Israel. Jesus picks 12 disciples. And for three and a half years, he pours himself into these 12 disciples, this notion of recreating community, you see. Uh, and after his death and resurrection, these disciples become, uh, become uh, the foundation of a new spiritual community, often referred to as the church. It is Jesus who will say, uh, through them to us today, where two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst. It is Jesus who declared that upon this rock, I will build my 
church, my spiritual gathering, my, my, my spiritual family, and it will be an eternal family, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is Jesus' solution, if you will, for your and my cry for a place to belong. A church family. Yeah, a Christian community. A, 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 a Jesus gathering. A Jesus gathering. Not just a place to show up and worship, but a place to go deep into community. Now, you know, the text that we read is this. So, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all, here it is, belong to each other. Here's this notion of, of uh, that Jesus is the head of this body, that he is left behind, and that we spiritually become a part of this body through uh, confession our faith in him as Lord and Savior. And for some of us, that's very dramatic. Uh, I remember as a kid uh, growing up in my uh, small town, they had summer revivals and you had to sit on what they call a mona's bench and and i sat on that bench for five nights everybody left the bench and that bench was supposed to be the bench where if you wanted to make a lifelong commitment to jesus you move from that bench to a uh to the disciple chair discipleship chair move to the chair and and i was waiting on some remarkable sign to so that i would know that jesus had saved me that was the language we used back then that he had come into my life i was looking for some dramatic and ultimately, I remember my granduncle, who was a pastor, stepping out and saying, look, boy, you know what the scripture says. If you believe in your heart that, that, um, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's come and he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead. If you believe that, move from that bench and take that seat and confirm your faith in Jesus. And I walked from the bench to the chair and it looked like I was walking five miles. I sit in that chair and it was as though the heavens opened up. And the Spirit of God fell on me in such a dramatic fashion. I and the entire chair found myself just shaking, 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 shaking. I think it was probably what the Bible called one of those moments where you're baptized in the Spirit. That was dramatic. But then I always have to be dramatic. My daughter, when she got ready to, to come to Jesus, she just told her mama, I want to be baptized. <laughs> that was it. And we asked him, well, listen, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came, he died, that he rose from the dead? Yes, she said. I think she was eight, nine years old. And she went forward to be baptized, and it was as simple as that. And the notion here is that the moment I say yes to Jesus, uh, the Scripture tells us that long, long ago that God decided to adopt us into his spiritual family. That's what the church represents, God's spiritual family through Jesus Christ. And the planning of this brought him great pleasure. And so, so, and so the moment we say yes to Jesus, we're to surrender our hearts and our mind, no matter who we are, no matter how messed up we think we are, the moment we make that decision, he adopts us into, it doesn't matter how much money we have or how little money we have, how good we look or how unattractive we may think we are, how many friends we have, how many friends we don't, how, how, how long and big our bad list is. The moment we say yes to the one who said yes to us, he adopts us into his family. We're called not just to believe, but to belong. And so he's the head of this spiritual body called the church that has local expressions. Now, let me just say a word here at NBCC. We create space for people who have not said yes to Jesus. Uh, so you're a part of our, what I call our, our physical community, and, and you're welcome to, and we create space, and we welcome you to, 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 to worship, to serve, to love, to grow, while we create space for you to consider, reflect on who Jesus is. And I pray that you'll see through us who he is. Jesus is the center of this community, but we create space for everyone. I invite you to come. Now, let me just say this, and as I hasten uh, to, towards uh, the, the, the pinnacle moment of this teaching, I had a thought the other day. Oftentimes, you've heard me teach this passage, if you've been around. Oftentimes, we think about love outward facing. As found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39, Jesus is asked, what are the most important commandments out of all of the commandments? And the text says, Jesus replies this way. 
You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. He says this is the first and the greatest commandment. And then he says the second is as equally as important. Watch this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we think about this. This is a wonderful. Whether you're a person of faith or not a person of faith, you would tend to say this is a great, this is a, this is a great target to aim for. And it's, I call it outwardly facing. We're, we're facing out. Love God. And we're facing out. Love the neighbor as yourself. But as I was thinking about the unique way that God has shaped the church, it dawned on me the other day as I was preparing this, this message. And it is, it, is, it is simply this. And we need to think about this. And it is in the church that we really learn this. And it is reinforced week after week and month after month. And here's the first thing that I really want you to get. I want you to sing it in. Yes, it is true. We must. We are called to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. But check this out. God has already decided to love you with all of his heart, soul, and mind. Whoever you are listening to me, God loves you with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his mind. And it's in the, the spiritual gathering, this, this Jesus community is where, where that message is reinforced again and again and again. It doesn't matter who you are, how good, how bad. God loves you. It's unconditional. He already does. He loves you now and tomorrow. And forevermore, with all of his heart, mind, and soul. And he creates this thing called the church family, where we, where part of it is we, we experience and we come to know that. And the other part, you know, where the outwardly says, love your neighbor. Well, check it out. In the church community, your neighbor loves you. We, 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 we share the same spiritual family. So the neighbors really call brothers and sisters across all of the various diversities. And, 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 and there, and there we created, I had them to create a, a little hand there to show this, right? One hand represents the hand of God, my gosh, who loves you with all that he has, and with all that he is. And the other hand represents the, the hand of, of imperfect uh, but faithful people who, is, who are also ready to love you with all that we are and with all that we have. And you see that space right in the center. That's where you fit. Right there. Right here. This is where you belong. Right there. My, my, my. Isn't that powerful? Here's one of my favorite verses that models this, that builds this out, that reinforces this. 1 John 3.16 says this, we know what real love looks like because, somebody shout because, because Jesus gave up his life for us. That's how we know that God loves you with all that he is. Jesus gave up his life for us. And so we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's the other hand. That's, that's what we're working to be in the, in the life of the church local church community that's what your that's what your soul longs for that's where you and I are called to belong now let me just talk to you quickly about some of the benefits of belonging to a church family and I know some of you may say well I've got I come regularly and I've got a regular place but the question is do you belong I know some of you say, well, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, you know if I choose to watch church on, on Sunday, uh, I, I'm going to watch you online. I appreciate that. But the question is, do you belong? Do you belong? This God is, is, is inviting us to make a deeper commitment here. Now, let me just make the case. You know, the church is the only place in all of the social constructs where we practice worship every week. Can you say worship? 
And in worship, there are two things that happen that are incredibly important. First of all, it cultivates our gratitude for God. You know, you know God, doesn't, God is not sitting up in heaven and saying, I've got this big ego and I need you to feed it. So y'all just think, get, get below and sing and sing and sing so you can feed my ego. That's not, no, 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 no. Worship is about us declaring to God uh, a, 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 a sense of gratitude, recognizing all of the different ways that God continues to pour his blessings into our lives and in the word of the psalmist bless the Lord O oh my soul and all that is within me and forget not his benefits and he talks about how he how he how he heals us and delivers us and redeems us crowns our heads with goodness and grace and as we cultivate a heart of gratitude it transforms who we are and how we see the world Worship, 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 I tell you. When you show up and, you, and you're part of singing with the people, or you're, the, or you're experiencing worship on, 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 online as we're engaging worship, it also reminds us, can you say remind? Because sometimes we have to be reminded. It reminds us of God's goodness and God's greatness. And we need to be reminded of God's greatness because, because the world will, will shrink all of that and focus us on all the bad. We need to, that's why we have to have a regular kind of cadence of, of showing up for worship and showing up for the church to be gathered together so that we can be reminded, be reminded, shout reminded. Oh, I love this, this, this one of the, uh, the praise songs we sung earlier today was our God is a firm foundation, our rock. The only solid ground as nations rise and falls, kingdoms once strong, now shaken. But we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. And then we sung this one. I am who you say I am. Come on now. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I'm who you say I am. You are for me. You are for me and not against me. I am who you say I am. This is what worship does, God. It reminds us who God is and who God says we are. Praise God. And the only place you find that it's in the Jesus community, in a, in a spiritual community. And even if you're listening to worship songs, that, well, that comes out of, a, out, of, out, of, out, of a, out of a Christian community. I invite you to lean in. Somebody shout, lean in. And then what you get in a Christian community is teaching, like I'm doing now, helps you to grow your faith and strengthen your faithfulness to Jesus. Now, here's the point I want you to know. You don't go to church. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of the church. The church gathers, you see. And after the church finishes gathering online or gathering in San Jose, then the church disperses. And, and, and we go out to be faithful to Jesus in how we live at home, to be faithful to Jesus in how we work and, and how we function in the world. And it's our job to equip you and to teach you and to reinforce that, you only find that in the church community. And then fellowship. Everybody shout fellowship. Do you know that the moment you say yes to Jesus and then say yes to a local church community, you're saying yes to a brand new family? A brand new family that you're now part of the, what we call the church universal. Everybody who said yes to Jesus in the past, in the present, and in the future is a part of your new family. And here's what that family does. It helps us to navigate and face life challenges while being committed to a community of Jesus followers somewhere. There's a community of Jesus followers that we say, that's my church. That's my church home. And let me just say a word about this new family. You know, uh, Paul writes these words. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. This is a powerful statement. When you start thinking about whether or not you should have a church family and whether or not you should go deeper in relationship with your church family, you know, what Paul says is, number one, you need to think of yourself with a sober judgment. Don't think too high of yourself. In other words, don't think that you're so important that you don't need a church family. If you didn't need a church family, the, 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 what underscores the importance of a church family is that Jesus gave it. 
The fact that Jesus died and through his shed blood and through his resurrection facilitated and gave birth to this thing called the church says how important it is to every human being on the planet if you would dare open your space. Yeah, you need it. You see, at the end of the day, as, as I've counseled people who've gone through death and grief, oftentimes many of the family members are not connected to church. And yet, as they work with the church to work through their funeral or memorial, they're reminded about the importance of faith. You see, all of us need a place to go where we're reminded about how faithful God is to us. We need a place to go regularly where we're reminded about his grace and his mercy where we're reminded and we can experience his forgiveness and where we, we become instruments of grace and mercy and forgiveness. No matter who you are, you need that. Your soul, soul has been shaped. Your life has been shaped for that. Your life has been shaped for that. So be sober-minded. And the other end of that is don't think of yourself too little. Don't think that you are not worthy to be a part of a church. Don't think you've got to wait until you get your life all fixed up before you can become a part of the church. No, the church is for you, just like you are. Jesus says, I came to save sinners and those who are in need. That's me, and that's you. And so, this is the community that helps us to navigate the challenges that we find in life. Lastly, it's in the church that we find what I call a process of development in God's love laboratory. Can you say love laboratory? Yes, it's in the church that we we learn to serve others as an expression of love, not based on what we can get, not based on what somebody's going to give us, but as an expression of love. We we, We practice that again and again and again here. And then here's the part that I really, really like. It's in the church that we learn to love, watch this, imperfect people on purpose. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you might have discovered how to love imperfect people accidentally in your house <laughs> or, or incidentally on your job. But, but, but it, is the, it, is the, it is the context of, 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 of a Jesus-centered community, of, the, of your church family, to help you to learn on purpose how to love obnoxious people, how to love impatient people, <laughs> how to love insensitive people. Come on now. Uh, how, to, how to pour grace and mercy, how to love folks that you radically disagree with politically, uh, uh, who you radically disagree with uh, based on their cultural perspective, uh, 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 how to become an individual who can say, I disagree, but I love how to empathize, how to listen to one another's stories. It's in the church that we learn how to do that. We uniquely work on that here at NBCC. And so you can see this is what Paul means when he says in chapter 12, verse 9, he says, so don't just pretend to love others, really love them. This is the place where you learn that. Where he says in verse 10, love each other with a genuine affection, the Greek word beneath that. Love each other like you're loving your blood, brothers and sisters, your biological brothers and sisters. Because at the end of the day, uh, these, these, these folk who share Christ with you, they are part of your eternal family. And take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in shining the light on your brothers, uh, elevating others, lifting them up. You learn how to do that, you see, in the church. In short, for those of you who come and watch regularly, I just want to say to you, I thank you. I'm so grateful for you come regularly in, at San Jose. You watch us regularly on, on, online. I'm so blessed that you do that. But I want to challenge you, don't just attend, belong. Don't just attend, belong. Rick Warren says this, the difference between a church attender and one who actually belongs is commitment. He, su- he, he suggested that an attender is simply a spectator on the sidelines, whereas one who belongs in our language here, who partners with what God is doing through NBCC, you're not just a spectator. You, you get involved. You engage in ministry. There's, there's a way for you to serve and to connect and to be a blessing here, even as you are being blessed online and or in person. Juan says that if you're just an attender, he says... 
You're kind of like you're a consumer, but the person who belong, who partners, you're a contributor. And you help to create this remarkable witness, if you're part of NBCC, this remarkable witness of, of people who love Jesus across race and class and politics. It is a marvelous and miraculous witness that, 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 that all by itself communicates in ways that transform the lives of people and says that Jesus is real. He's real. Here's my last point. So don't just attend. I want to challenge you. Belong. Belong. Finally, for some of you, belonging begins with baptism. Next weekend, we're going to be created. We're going to be setting aside to baptize those who are ready to express their faith in Jesus. And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. I particularly like this passage here. He says, he says, some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles and some are slaves and some are free. Watch this. Look at all those radical distinctions. He says, but we have all been baptized, shout baptized, baptized into one body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. Is baptism required to be saved, to be part of, 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 of eternal life as it, as it flows through Jesus? No. But it is extraordinarily important. It's so important that, that when Jesus got ready to commence his ministry, you know the first thing he did? He was baptized. And John the Baptist was baptized and people tell him to repent of their sins. And he saw Jesus come. He said, look, <laughs> you don't need to do any of that. <laughs> I know who you are. And Jesus says, suffer it uh, to fulfill all righteousness. I'm creating a model here. This is, this is an outward expression of the fact that I'm starting something new and I'm giving birth to a new community. And this, this is what baptism is. So that's what I want to just say to you. And from that point forward, when, when the disciples, early disciples begin to, 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 to build out the church, you know, Peter preached and 3,000 people joined according to Acts and immediately they were baptized. And this is this notion in the early uh, Jerusalem church that as people came to, to confess in Jesus, they were immediately baptized. They didn't put it off until they got mature or they reached a certain point. No, 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 no. It, there's, there's an immediate action for baptism. It, it, God calls us to be baptized. Why? Number one, it represents new beginnings in your life. Publicly so. The, the dipping in the water and the coming out, uh, the pouring of the water suggests that, that there's a spiritual cleansing that starts a brand new beginning in your life. It represents this notion that, that your old life come on now, is buried with Jesus and you rise up into a brand new, into a new walk and a new relationship with Jesus. One of our young people said it most beautifully. I think she was about seven, eight years old. She's getting ready to be baptized this weekend. They said, why are you, what, what does baptism mean to you? She says, I'm getting baptized to show the world that I love Jesus. That's it. It becomes your public expression of how much you love Jesus. And one final other thing happens in that act of baptism. We say that there's a kind of sealing experience. The Holy Spirit just confirms in your heart that the love and, and the claim of Jesus is forever on your life. You can't reverse the baptism, you see. When you go down and you come out, we pour the water on you. Come on now. You, you, you can't, like, reverse it. You come up in this new relationship with God, and, 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 and God claims you even as you have claimed him, and you've made it public to the world. I belong to Jesus, and God declares, and you belong to him forever and always. Amen. Amen. I'll end here. Listen, for some of you who are thinking about taking that next step, moving from attending to belonging, if you're watching this online before our 9 o'clock a.m. gathering, just hang out. We've got a, a newcomers event following just for you, and, uh, and there's information on our website because we believe that wherever you live across the country, across the world, NBCC is a unique community. The one I've just described, God is talking to somebody. Somebody else is listening to me. NBCC is not your community. God is saying to you, you know what? You need to go to your home church. Whatever the situation was, God is saying, church is never meant to be perfect. 
It's not a group of perfect people. It's a group of redeemed people. And God is saying, they need you there. He's inviting you to reconnect, to go deep. For somebody else, your church was a toxic city. You really do need a different experience. We offer our hearts open to you. And ultimately, if you have not been baptized, you've been walking with God, but you have not been baptized, I want to challenge you to be baptized this coming weekend. Just go ahead. If you're in the local area, sign up. The link is right here. Go ahead and sign up. If you're not in the local area, let us know. Follow this link. Notify us that you're interested in being baptism, and we will connect with you. But at the end of the day, you were made to belong right here in a Jesus-centered community in the cuff between a God that loves you with all he has and a people who love you with all we have. Amen.